and they're not living together and then they're living separately etc 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 there's a whole number of pages here about this and <coughs> he was considering getting legally divorced but he actually you know he didn't end up getting divorced for, he died before that was able to take place uh, I visited Lord North on, on his marriage with okay also George Savile he showed me papers sent him as from the lady requiring clothes jewels gold watch giving him to understand that otherwise she would buy them over again he took this for a threat and on insolence shown him that is unpardonable <coughs> resolved to return no answer he then bemoaned his condition that he could not prove to the satisfaction of court his wife wife's falseness to his bed and although he had no great proof of her crime he found Mrs. Mr. Livens and her alone together and being surprised she called out a rape okay so anyway you get the idea of what's going on here Okay, now let's look at George Savile's will. And George Savile is Mary uh, Pratt's first husband. Okay, so he it was this, the will was written uh, July 9th, 1743. Let's go back here and look at his dates here. <coughs> he died September 17, 1743, and the will was approved December 15, 1743. Now in his will, this is the summary that I had, he, he gives some money. He had two daughters and one son, and George, Sav George Savile his son, uh, by the way, died without issue. <coughs> Nonetheless, he has he names his son George, his daughter Barbara, and daughter Arabella. And Arabella uh, married John Thornaw, and uh, she was the mother of Mary Arabella Thornaw that married Francis Ferdinand Fuljambi. Barbara, I think, married the Lumleys. She was not married yet, as far as I know. So anyway, <clears throat> you know, here it is. My daughter's Arabel Savile and Barbara Savile. He basically talks about that, but there's not one mention of his wife at all. Anywhere in this. <coughs> he also mentions his sister, Gertrude Savile. And she's mentioned a little bit in the records of the Lumleys of Lumley Castle. He has a cousin named Elizabeth Ogle. <coughs> Mentions her, her, um, her pastor. And then there's a codicil, but it doesn't amount to much <clears throat> of anything. So, he, so George Savile completely disinherited Mary Pratt. Okay, well, <clears throat> fine, okay. Now, George Savile, her son, the eighth baronet, who died actually in 1784, um, okay, so let's go back to the situation. We have Mary Pratt, whose father supposedly was impoverished. There was some wealth that came to um, her mother, <coughs> Honoretta Pratt. Um, and I guess I'll go into that next. Here, and she does say that she has a daughter of... Lady Savile, she says she's the relict of John Pratt, the Vice Tre Treasurer of Ireland, and she lives at St. George Hanover Square. <coughs> and then she wants her body burnt upon the plain. She has a great niece, Mary Bernard, uh, Jean Bornobo, 
great nephew, Captain Bartell, niece Bartell, Mrs. Borden, daughter to her niece, Ella Harton, Mrs. Reed, Carolina Cox, a great niece, great niece, Elizabeth Coddington, Lady Caldwell, her great niece, and Leek, her great niece, <coughs> Miss Catherine Fropod, niece, um, to, to her deceased husband, nephew John Fitzmaurice, um, great niece Miss Dowsville, <coughs> nephew John Lort, Earl Shorebone, niece Lenora, great nephew <laughs> Gertrus, Countess Dowager of you know, a couple other nieces. All of these people are actually blood relatives of hers. Uh, I've looked, I've investigated this thoroughly. <coughs> now, we get all these people in here as beneficiaries. She signs it on a red of Pratt. And then finally. <coughs> She does a codicil, and she names. There's a bunch of codicils here, but um, she she mentions Lady Scarborough. She has 13 codicils, and finally, I think in one of these codicils. If at all, she just mentions that she has a daughter, Lady Savile, and gives her 100 pounds if I got this right. Let me just find this. It's, it's so, it's huge. <clears throat> now, the gentleman's, um, in the gentleman's magazine, they were saying that she just was such a happy woman that loved everybody that she decided to give money to the butcher, the banker, and the candlestick maker. Well, she just didn't forget any of her family members, but none of the individuals. Um, here we go. And to my daughter, Lady Savile, the sum of 100 pounds, together with an antique seal and her pearl bracelet. And that's all she got from her mother, and her father absolutely dis disowned her. Uh, her husband disowned her. Her father was pretty much broke. Any wealth that came to Henrietta Brooks Pratt was uh, from her being Lady of the Bedchamber, so she had a good amount of money, but she only gave 100 pounds to to her. <clears throat> okay, so now Mary Pratt is a single woman and she gets married to a man named Thomas Wallace. And what Thomas Wallace does is he As far as I know, he just gives her his estate for for use for life, and then bequests it. My dear wife, Lady Savile, her heirs and assigns for over all the, the dwelling house, <clears throat> the yards, garden, townhouses, stables at Twickingham. Okay, so. So the, the the Twickenham estate that that was in Dr. Charles Morton's will came from Thomas Wallace, accrued to Mary Savile, and upon his marriage to her, he he gained that property there. So <coughs> so I don't know enough about Thomas Wallace, but um, pretty much that's the key thing. So now we may have accounted for. The land in Westmoreland, if 
the um, annuity from Henry Berkeley was large enough, we may have accounted we have accounted for the Twickingham, we have not accounted for the Irish estates. And Mary Pratt, I don't see it as having um, I don't see him mention anything about Irish estates. So that's that's what I think happened. Um, So we still got a mystery of the Irish estates. How did he get them? And, and again, I'm still thinking that his father was the John Morton who lived in Ireland. You know, I, I really want to see that will in the uh, Irish National Library because I because there there are if that is not his father, <laughs> then. Um, and there's a lot of speculation as to what, where he actually came from, and there are some very antidotal, <coughs> very small antidotal things. Also, looking at George Savile Eighth Baronet, just to let you know, he, um, even though his mother outlived him, he dis he disowns his mother in favor of the full zombies. And um, that's it for that. Now, another ancillary set of wills that I've looked at, I was trying to see if I could find a, a father for Charles Carr. And um, so I just picked any will that looked like it would be around the right time for either Kerr or Carr. And, the only, and this uh, will of Charles Kerr of St. James Westminster... had this right, which was proved in 1771, which is about the right time for him to show up and maybe have been born. He does have this is such horrible writing. It's just disgustingly horrible. It's almost not even worth buying. Um This individual, Charles Kerr, gives his money to a widow named Catherine due to her kindness to him during life. This is very likely to be not connected to anything. Then there's a Charles Kerr of London, 1765. This seems to be a little more promising. But he, he has beneficiaries in America. In, uh, America. In, actually in Quebec, so his descendants ended up going to Canada. And then this one that was proved in 1770, there are a couple more wills for cars and curs, but I, you know, I can't spin, you know, <laughs> three pounds fifty for nothing and crappy writing all the time, but, um, that's actually Mary Crawford. Now this has a little writing on the side here, says he has a wife, Mary Carr. And he has a son, Charles Carr. But, and he has a daughter, Ann Carr. But And it seems to imply that Ann is his daughter by marriage, which would seem to contradict this. I, I, I just don't know. I'm and looking at and remember and again looking at Dr. Charles Morton's will and seeing how he's kept separate the lands. I am thoroughly convinced, or uh, until I see better, until I see that will of Dr. Uh, of, uh, of the John Morton that died, 1754 in Ireland, and until I have occasion to see that, I am more inclined to trust it even though I've been told personally that 